In this packet, we go in search of Flashman. One of my favourite things about the Flashman papers is how George MacDonald Fraser sets them out as reality. When Flashman was originally released in America in 1969, a third of the 40 reviewers fell for Fraser's trick and reported them as fact. The New York Times gathered and published these reviews, with one stating that the book is the most important literary discovery since the Boswell papers. Fraser was amused and appalled at the same time. It's a testament to how deeply they were researched and how well Fraser managed to write the narrative in first-person Victorian, although it's probably a lot more to do with how little the reviewers knew their history or bothered to check. It's a trick that's been used before by other writers. When the narrative of Arthur Pym of Nantucket by Edgar Allan Poe was first released in 1838, it caused a huge stir. The book was published as an actual account of events by Pym, without Poe's name on the book. It told the story of a whaling ship that suffers a mutiny with most of the crew set adrift or murdered by each one being bashed on the head and thrown overboard. This is just the start of a long line of gruesome and unfortunate events. So if you're not careful and don't pay attention to the facts, it's easy to get carried away. My uncle tells a story that when War of the Worlds was broadcast on the radio with Orson Welles, my nan thought it was a real invasion. She called the whole family into the kitchen and said the aliens have landed and it was war and she'll make everyone a cup of tea. Strangely, he doesn't mention that this famously fooled many others, but they were in America where the play was actually broadcast. So if my nan did hear it, it would have been a while later in England and well after the news of the famous hoax was out. But why let the truth get in the way of a good story? And it certainly was the sort of thing she would have done. With Flashman, we have something written so well, set amongst real people, that it's easy to take the next step into believing it's fact. Fraser himself tells of fans contacting him in a belief that they are descendants of one of Harry's many illegitimate offsprings. If a story is presented in the right way, and we want to believe it, it then carries a lot of weight. So to add weight to the belief, I have found in the Flashman papers three references to where Harry's image has been captured. The first one, I can't find. In The Angel of the Lord, Harry tells us of the time he was with John Brown's gang moving between northern state towns, drumming up support before the raid on Harper's Ferry. It was taken in New York in May 1859, and Brown poses for a photograph, which they gave away with three hats. He is sitting down in an armchair with Joe Simpson, the undercover slave, sat next to him. Jerry Anderson and Harry stand behind. I've done the usual Google searches, but nothing shows up. If anyone can point me in the right direction for this, please leave a note in the comments and I'll make an update to this video. This would be great to see, as we could also see a likeness of Joe Simpson. The next up is a guess on my part. This is Harry with Abraham Lincoln and a group of US Army. Harry tells us about this picture in The Great Game, where he also alludes to his further adventures during the American Civil War. This is tricky to find, but after a few hours I managed to find something that fits the description with one of the subjects who actually looks like Harry. What a great photo. It puts Harry right next to one of the most important American figures of his time, and by doing so, authenticates Harry's stories of the West. What a shame we don't have the events surrounding the picture in the missing packet. The final image is in a painting by Thomas Jones Barker called The Relief of Lucknow, where Havelock and Altram greet Campbell, another from the great game. Flashman reports that he is one of the mounted figures with his hand raised looking like John the Baptist. There are three mounted figures with hands in the air, but as one has no whiskers and the other is pointing, the only figure that fits the bill is the one dressed in white. It doesn't look like Barker has captured Harry's good looks though. Flashman also says that he wasn't even there when the moment took place as he was in the latrines. For all Harry's fame and a knack for being at most of the major events of the 19th century, we only have this painted image of him. I'm sure if we looked hard enough there would be a few more. Maybe we can take a look at this in another packet. I'll leave you with something to think about. When researching this packet, I was reading Fraser's explanation of how he came up with the idea of Flashman, and he talks about something amazing. Flashman actually existed. I'll say that again to let it sink in. Flashman did exist. A pupil at school with Thomas Hughes at rugby had written a letter which Fraser says was definite on the point of Flashman, but he does not clearly identify exactly who it was. Fraser believed he found out who, a successful soldier and ruffian, but without any evidence he chose not to say any more on this. Perhaps one day we could offer a few suggestions ourselves.
So there you have it, a quick march through the likenesses of Flashman, as told to us by Flashy himself, and I've seen a few other likelies in researching this packet. How about you? Seen any likely Flashman photos or paintings? How about sharing them in the comments below? I'd love to hear from you at Flashman Study. If you want to see more of these videos, why not hit that subscribe button? And if you like what you saw here, how about giving us a plucky thumbs up? Thanks for joining us, and remember, would you like nuts or cigars, sir?